Hello, welcome back. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in New York City at the NYSE New York Stock Exchange here in our Cube East studios here on the show floor. I'm John Furrier again. We are bringing you all the action this week. Climate Week is here, UN General Assembly. Of course, we left talking about generative AI and technology. Tech for sustainability is a topic. Robert Murphy is the co-founder and CEO of Othersphere. Robert, thanks for coming on theCUBE. John, thanks for having me. So obviously, um, I just did a tweet called, you know, hashtag tech for sustainability. I don't think I've ever seen that hashtag before, so I thought it was clever. Um, probably has been out there, but this is really a big part of sustainability, technology innovation. Um, more now more than ever, now that you got the big data actually really happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got generative AI has opened up the aperture for users and applications, and certainly with agentic systems coming, puts a lot of a lot of emphasis on if you can make data and technology scale work to your advantage, you can move the needle big time in these hard problem areas. Um, add to that the fact that companies like NVIDIA, Broadcom, and some of these semiconductor companies and the, and the hyperscalers like AWS, Google, and others, they're bringing essentially supercomputing to the masses and democratizing compute power. So we're starting to see visibility in our Q research teams putting out a narrative on this. I talk about it all the time. What's after cloud? And cloud brought SaaS to us, mm -hmm. okay, and large scale um, compute and uh, operator efficiency. Now you're starting to see agentic systems kind of be a new add on to SaaS, and a new category is emerging um, that I call scalable apps. And these are new entrepreneurial solved problems where people are looking at hard problems that couldn't be solved in the past and using the power of the cloud and supercomputing capabilities to solve stuff. You see it in healthcare, biology, chemistry, and in climate change. It's, it's an emerging area, we're seeing it early now. This is a big, gonna be a big part of our conversation in the next few years. You're in the middle of technology and sustainability and climate. This is a big area. What, what's your reaction to that and, and what's your thoughts? I think you hit the nail on the, nail on the head. Uh, we're covering this, we're actually coming in from two sort of different angles that are really relevant to this. So what we're building is a software platform to accelerate the deployment of hardware functionally. So we're really looking at deploying low carbon infrastructure as quickly as possible. So whether you're building green hydrogen or low carbon data centers, it's all the same concept as how do we build quickly? We need to deploy trillions of dollars very fast to catch up with our climate goals. And the reality is building anything in the real world is very hard. Yeah. So our software platform basically breaks the world into little sort of under square kilometer tiles and we assess billions of potential project permutations uh, for any given capital asset all at once. So let you basically search the globe. So we've sort of created a search engine for sustainable infrastructure. So the idea then is we help those who are designing, building, funding this infrastructure do their jobs well. And that's part of it. So that's where our current system is built all in the cloud. It's made possible with that supercomputing, all the data that the world is gathering and we're bringing together to try to sort of help the world make so you're choices. A, you're a use case. You're an example of leveraging the timing and the nexus of supercomputing, large scale data sets availability, in this case, creating a grid. Absolutely. I mean, it's like grid computing. Yeah, we could use we, that word. It's an old word, but it's coming back. We couldn't do what we're doing today well, maybe five years ago, but, but it'd be very difficult uh, with the compute capacity available today and the data available today. And that's not just about data collection and sort of sensors and more sort of actually we're bringing more information about the real world. It's also there's more open data, there's more sort of push to make these things more commoditized so the world can react better. So on the one hand, we're doing that to hopefully deploy infrastructure more quickly. But we're also on the other side of it because we are a user of big compute, we use AI. And so we are sort of then thinking about how are we part of the problem? How can we be part of the solution? And so in particular, they're helping deploy data centers using AI. So AI to build AI um, is what we can do to hopefully do it in a more sustainable way. It's interesting. Uh, you, it was, what I love about your story and your company, one, the mission's phenomenal, two, but you're on both sides. And you know, I was talking about this on the, my last podcast last week with Dave Vellante, my co-host, co-founder of theCUBE, is that you know, we're seeing an evolution now um, that we've ne I've never seen in my career where you're seeing like all the inflection points I've been involved in either had either back-end innovation, inflection point, game changer, or front-end. Web, front-end, yeah, servers, I guess not really much, but mostly front-end. I could search the web, mobile, mm -hmm. front-end, yeah, the back-end, cloud. Um, and then cloud came on, that's a back-end. So front-end, front-end, back-end, okay. Um, and now, with this wave, it's both back-end and the front-end. So you're application, notable, is great mission. And if that works, it's great. But the back end, you have to be involved in both. And we're seeing companies 
now look at resetting their entire platforms mm -hmm. because they have to be both back end and front end. So for example, I can just, can't I just adopt the new stack and say, hey, I'm on the new stack. I'm Look at me, I got all the fashion. But if they don't put the processes in place that on the app side, that falls down. So it's, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on IT builders, developers, executives, whether they're fighting defensive intelligent threats on the, on the security side or just rolling out an, end -to -end an application with, with generative AI. So both of those theaters are right. exploding with opportunity. But if you don't do it right, it's a problem. I'm sure you agree, but that's what you're doing. Yeah, and we're trying to retrofit basically a lot of processes, whether they're IT processes or financial processes in terms of how we should deploy capital in the real world. And we have to do it fast because we're behind in terms of our climate goals. And so to get up, to catch up with those things, we need sort of the big players of the world, the big companies, big financiers, the governments to move in quickly. But it's not easy to do that. It's not that you can snap your fingers because they work with the systems that are in place around them. And so this takes time. So we're trying to help. And I think that's going to also determine who wins and who loses. And I think, you know, the people who can do both, it's a little bit more cap backs of funding, but the, the, the spoils will be will be there for whoever does it. Let's take a minute to discuss what you guys do. We jumped right in because I love the, the climate change and tech angle you guys have. Um, talk about the company, the mission, uh, the origination story, what you guys do. Yeah, so the story, well, I grew up in oil and gas. I grew up in Yemen because my dad worked in oil and gas. So I never got very creative. I never, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and so I worked I in the regulated industry. Uh -huh. <laughs> And so I worked in energy my whole life. I worked as an oil and gas consultant and a renewable energy consultant as the World Bank for a few years, midstream companies as a Chevron for a long time, and then moved over to the startup world. So I was at an environmental data startup for about five years, really loved the idea of just building something new. It shortens your life, but it's fun. And so started Other Sphere with my co-founder. We spun out a breakthrough energy, Bill Gates' climate funding vehicle. They sort of got us off the ground. And we've been working with phenomenal partners like Google since. And basically the goal is to, we're actually doing some, we're doing an extra level of complexity because the hardware we're trying to accelerate out into the world is a lot of what the breakthroughs of the world are funding. So the new ways of making green steel or lower carbon cement, that's very hard in terms of physical process perspective. But then it's equally hard to get that actually scaled. So you can prove your machine works, but then you need the financiers, the insurers, the regulators and customers to all get behind you. And so what we're trying to do is bring that piece together and help the markets as a whole move more quickly because it's a multi-stakeholder exercise. It's everyone it down to communities too, that you can have the best product in the world, the best technology, but if people don't want it built near you, you have a problem. What's your North Star? I want to get into some of the tactical things you're doing because this is, again, a big idea. It's one of those go big or go home kind of moments. Yeah. Um, and by the way, there's a good market for it. I don't think you guys are going to go home because the data center we'll get to in a second and nuclear reactors soon. Um, what's the North Star? When you see a steady state for your business, what does that look like? Who are you selling to? What does that future look like? Well, we want to basically be a multi-commodity, multi-user platform over time. So we cover, we started with hydrogen today, we move on to data centers, a sustainable aviation fuel, a variety of other sort of commodity and infrastructure sectors, but then bring in those other stakeholders. We start with developers, so the company's actually putting steel in the ground, but then move to the financiers, the insurers, the policymakers, the off-takers. All of these stakeholders who need to be part of the solution. So we help with analysis. So our whole platform is very much sort of big data, AI you know, analysis platform. But our main mission is alignment to drive action. And so can we actually have these groups work together to scale better solutions more quickly? And your customers are trying to deploy infrastructure, <laughs> CapEx infrastructure, yes. to do things, whether it's computing or do something in their business and do it in a sustainable way. That's yeah. the, that's it's, the a, mission. it's basically deploying um, hardware to yeah. do maybe basically create or work with electrons, molecules, or bits. And that's sort of all of the things we need to be reforming pretty quickly while also giving people all, I mean, what, what we have here and giving us better, fancier yeah. things over time, but also the billions of people around the world who don't have any of it yet. So there's a huge challenge in terms of human prosperity yeah. set against the challenge of how you should deliver it without making a mess of everything in the process. Well, first of all, a lot of these, um, big ideas sometimes don't get off the ground because you got to either have that beachhead landing business model that evolves over time. We all know startups, as Steve Jobs famously said, you don't end, you don't end up building what you originated, it can you zigzag around it, but it's still, a, you stay on the North Star. Um, the market right now, if you look at the CapEx spending on data centers and cloud providers, for example, you mentioned Google, and there are others like AWS, even Oracle said they're going to have a nuclear reactor, um, and Three Mile Island, Microsoft's going to turn off that came out of the times. Um, there's a demand yes. for power and data center capacity, which is essentially electricity. And you know, our raw materials of Earth are needed. So, and it's not always there. I mean, I can buy all the GPUs from NVIDIA, 
But if I can't get the power, I could have them all looking beautiful in the rack. But if I don't have the power envelope, I can't run them. Yep. So people are looking at this now as a global phenomenon. Then um, again, the capex spending is so high, it's kind of an arms race mm -hmm. there. There's a huge impact to climate with this. And it's not just in the U.S. You got China as well. So you got it's a global market. What's your how are you guys selling to that? What's the value proposition to those guys? Are you selling to them? Are you targeting those companies? Are you targeting enterprises how to run the new data centers with the new gear? What are some of the customers you have right now? Well, we work, we started working with hydrogen in, in initially, and so mostly industrial customers, developers, some hardware OEMs, and so working at the hydrogen sector, and then data centers is a natural bridge from that because some of them were actually interested in using hydrogen as backup power, but also a hydrogen electrolyzer, which uses electricity to make hydrogen, is actually in some ways fairly similar to a data center, at, at, de de depending on the scale. And so what they're all looking for is a place where you can find land. They want water. They want to be able to build, uh, you know, hopefully, near people that are accepting of that. They want cheap power, whether it's electricity or gas-fired backup or whatever the sort of the inputs are for that. And then they, uh, the difference is really the off-takers. So hydrogen are looking for someone to actually use their hydrogen. Data center developers looking for sort of the, the transmission bandwidth to get low latency compute to their end users. So it's all a location question. And then what's really interesting now is that a lot of these uh, sort of co physical commodity decarbonization pathways lean on electricity. Not all of them, but there's a lot of bias towards using electricity for one thing or another. If they're competing with data centers and compute for those green electrons, we have a huge bottleneck then in terms of how quickly we can build the renewable capacity we need to generate the power, but also move it around. So transporting energy is one of our biggest problems. And so how do we solve for that while the two of them not running into each other? My hope is actually they can be collaborative. So I can say, I'm gonna build a data center here and it actually may make sense to uh, build an electrolyzer next door because they, one can serve the other, but also maybe the data center team will be happy because they're near uh, transmission lines. The electrolyzer team will be happy because they're near pipelines or near off takers. And so there's a way to do these things in a coherent aligned way. And that's how we hopefully solve it. And problems. you're in hydrogen now. Not yes. yet in data center. We're in the middle of developing that for right now. Okay. So what what is the business plan for your company? Um, I see you mentioned data center because you're bringing up kind of a, a system design. By looking at the elements together, um, it's really a holistic approach. Exactly. Is that, is that what you want to be? Yeah. We're basically, it's enterprise science. So our, our users subscribe to the tool. Uh, and basically what it does is it looks at every site around the world, billions of permutations, and we rate them on three main criteria, economics, emissions, and fit with local surroundings. And that's the holistic piece. So you have to do it right. And you can just optimize for yeah. cheap, but eventually the climate piece will catch up with you. But also if you don't look at the local human and environmental factors, eventually the project is slowed down or doesn't happen at all. Yeah. And so how do you think about these things quickly, but effectively together? You know, Robert, you know, the constant theme I'm hearing in all the innovators that come on the cube is in this wave, besides the whole, the theaters, the back end, front end innovation, is that, is that the democratization aspect comes in. For example, I could imagine um, your software being used for municipalities. Yep. Um, one of the things that we're tracking on the Cube and Silicon Angle and the re Cube research is edge computing is gonna have um, capability. You have um, electronic cars, you're gonna have cameras on every corner, you're gonna have instrumentation. We're living in a world where connectivity is going to be dealing with bits, mm -hmm. data, and data is the key to all this. So as this data, this problem goes, okay, big problem now is data centers and solving that. But it's energy, it's electricity, everything's there, but also the impact aspect. I mean, in the yeah. past, what is a small town or anyone just, hey, I'm going to put in a, I'm going to build my town so that every Tesla could be managed properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pluggable. What do you do there? Well, you have to think about it. I mean, it's already they've already been pushed back. I mean, the Three Mile Island announcement is very interesting, but there's already been pushed back around the U.S. and globally for data centers that sort of if they use like gas-fired backup and some local emissions, or are they going to sort of undermine or raise local power prices? So there's a, there's all these knock-on effects. And so if you come in, you build large-scale infrastructure, you deploy a lot of capex, you hopefully create jobs in the community, you hopefully create a lot of local benefit. But can you actually watch out for the negative consequences and the unintended consequences and plan around them and either avoid them? or work with communities right up front so everyone knows what they're getting themselves into and have sort of benefits from the projects feed back to communities so that it isn't more of a sort of an extractive relationship where I'm going to put a thing on the ground, it's going to take your power and take your water, and you're going to just watch it from a distance. But how do we do this together? The impact is huge. I think having that sustainability and impact of the earth is key. You can kind of kill two birds with one stone in this case with your, with your software. Um, quick question on the climate change since we're in climate week. How would you peg... Um, the area where that market we're in now, early innings, and now see it feels super, not even game on yet, but 
you guys are now looking encroaching into what I see as a you know, tech innovation play mm -hmm. for climate as a first party citizen to the value proposition. It's like Uber. Uber is not a taxi company. It's a tech company that has ride hailing, they call it. So, you know, they do two things. They help people. Mm -hmm. Okay, get from point A to point B. Now they got food uh, and others. But they're really a tech company. Yeah. And so it sounds like this is kind of the fee. Yeah. I wonder how, in terms of where we are with all of this. So Uber's a good example. So Uber basically came along and in some ways sort of didn't, they didn't disrupt, but they replaced taxi companies. They just replaced what we were doing. They kind of just pushed to sort of an existing player aside. I think with climate, because it's so regulated, these sectors are so interwoven into our lives and they're very expensive and the infrastructure, like once it's built, people want to use it, that the incumbents are essential. I don't think you can come along and be an Uber of uh, pick your sector, pick of, uh, of steel and pick, I mean, it's unlikely, it's possible. It's unlikely to build a whole new steel company that basically overwhelms all the incumbents. Yeah. I think you work with them. I think you, they have the experience, they know how to build these things, they run them for a long time. You help them just run them better. And they're all trying from the inside, but the markets expect certain things of them. And I think you're, man turns. you're managing the incumbents. Yes. Yeah. You, you're doing. And they're full of people who want to do really good work. Like there's no one, like I was in oil and gas for a long time. Yeah. There's full of our scientists and very few of them went to school to destroy the earth. Yeah. They're there trying to make a difference, keep the lights on yeah. for all of us. And so how do it's, we. It's then, a need. We all need that. Exactly. Yeah. So talk about some of the cool things you're doing. What's the, some of the cool projects you're working on internally to power your value uh, mm -hmm. platform? You guys do a lot of work with data to give us some. Uh, Let's, let's talk about what you guys are doing. What are the, what are, what's the coolest thing you guys got going on? We have dozens and dozens of data layers to drive our analysis. And some of them, I actually really enjoy the data side. I think it's my sort of like pet favorite area. But let's, say, what let's are, get into it. My broader team, one of the things they've done is sort of basically optimization of projects. So when you build a hydrogen electrolyzer, you want to think about sort of its actual profile. And so you're balancing for hourly power prices, hourly grid carbon intensity, hourly wind and solar data how you actually want to deliver to all your off takers. And so that process is very computationally intensive, but you need to do it to sort of then set your renewables project that's part of the project to the right size, the actual electrolyzer the right size, the whole system. So what we did is basically uh, train AI models on our billions of modeled projects to then be able to do this very quickly. So it would take hundreds of years potentially to sort of optimize all these projects individually. But by using AI, we're able to do it where basically it runs, we do, every time we retrain the model, it loads from users immediately. And in like 30 seconds, they can go from the AI version to the actual deterministic model at the project level. And that's a huge leap in terms of being able to give the fidelity to our users to know where good projects are. Yeah, look, I mean, first of all, I think it's mind blowing. And I think to me, that is just such an awesome thing because I mean, could have you have done that a decade ago? No. I mean, that would have been a high performance computing problem. Hundreds of thousands of hours of compute time, rented than some HPC farm somewhere. Yeah. You know, come back with an answer. The lag is off the charts. And there's also where one of the upsides of AI, because there's a lot of conversation about AI using a lot of energy. And that's right. And if we use AI for like nicer cat videos, there's maybe a missed opportunity yeah. there. But for us, uh, we basically use AI to avoid a lot of that sort of brute force compute. And so it's a more efficient way, both from a cost and energy perspective, to get to the right answer. So AI for us actually reduces a lot of energy use in that case. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned AI for cat videos. This brings up a distinction. I want to get your thoughts on this because you're you're in, in, you're you're in it right now. What is operational AI? Okay, I'm just made the term up, but call it operational. There's operational benefits to AI, and I think there's a, there's a question of AI is a bubble. Um, I think it's going to be not as bad as a dot-com bubble because I think there'll be some dead companies that just didn't invest in both back-end, front-end, or too much back-end, not on the front-end. So I think there'll be some 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 carnage, but I don't think it's going to pop. I think there'll be slow air will come out of the, the bubble because there's real operational advantages. Yeah. You're an example of that, just what you just said. You're using the compute power and all the capabilities you have now at your fingertips through uh, Google Cloud and others to actually do the work. Exactly. And so you can actually apply AI. I call this operational AI. Some people call it causal AI. But AI as, an, as a layer to manage either complexities uh, with automation, whether it's building new abstraction layers, managing data sets, doing projects like managing the compute. I mean, just you can solve problems. We're seeing it in all these hard verticals. These are the scalable apps I was talking about. Yeah. Chemistry, right. you're seeing it. You're seeing it in biology here with climate, this is a first generation opportunity for entrepreneurs. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Especially for sort of really hard computational challenges, as you're saying, sort of like gene editing and folding and so on, or what we're doing in terms of climate modeling or basically industrial systems modeling. 
It's hard to do it the old fashioned brute force way. We were well past the Excel version. I mean, the world still works in Excel uh, and it's a great tool, but it isn't up to the challenges of some of the things we're facing. And then I think on the day to day, there's absolutely some overshoot. I'm sure there's lots of sort of hype and froth and all this, but there's a lot of fire inside that smoke. And because I think AI will have a lot of role to play in sort of making a lot of our tasks easier, people more effective, uh, and then hopefully helping challenge or solve some of these really hard challenges. What's really great is the sustainability goals have always been on corporate, all of our top guests we've had on the cube, CEOs and leaders all talk about sustainability. I won't say it's been cliche or it's been kind of like it's just, you know, lip service because it's hard. I think now with solutions like what you're doing is I can see this idea of having a managed service saying, hey, I want to deploy something on infrastructure for whatever, whether it's edge computing or whatever, and pull up data mm -hmm. in, in a very quick way, assess and actually architect and deploy infrastructure. Yeah. The alternative would be, okay, get some funding, get a committee, hire a consultant. No one knew what to do. It's hard, well, that's the thing. I no think one people are well-intentioned. There's very few people that want to actually like, ruin the world. <laughs> uh, it's just hard. Uh, and then so, yeah, if you're having to go out and gather the data manually, bring people together, do some analysis in Excel, put some things in some maps and so on, it's slow, it's cumbersome. But uh, so we're not just talking about if you're like building a data center, but if you're looking to where do you actually want to sort of lease space and actually yeah. put your compute in a data center, be able to sort of understand very quickly what that market looks like and where will be the lowest carbon commute because our compute. Because it's not just the hyperscalers and the building and operating data centers, it's everyone using it too. So we, we are built in Google Cloud so we can see our carbon footprint and we move all of our compute to the lowest, their sort of highest carbon-free energy regions. And that's critical for us. And I think we're not alone at all. Other sphere, that name. Yes. What's the meaning behind it? What's, how did you guys come to that? <laughs> Was it you and your co-founders said, we're going to build another sphere? I mean, the sphere in Vegas is hot right now, so I love the word sphere in there. You know, it's, biosphere, I mean, all kinds of, what's the meaning behind it? It was me sitting in the garage during COVID with a little bit too much time on my hands, probably. <laughs> but it's basically, we're trying to bring together a sort of atmosphere, biosphere, cryosphere, anthrosphere, in terms of all the human elements. So it's basically this global systems model, and we need to be thinking about how all these things interplay with each other. And so we focus a lot on sort of the human and the economics and sort of side of things, and we're more and more aware of the environmental piece. But really, it's like what happens when you sort of push down on one button over here, what happens on the other side of the world? And so other sphere was a try not to have an overly grandiose way of saying we're trying to bring those spheres together and try to have build understanding around how our actions collectively have impact out in the world. You're a data company, you're a platform company, you're a tech company with climate as a first party citizen as an application built into it. Would that be a fair? That's very, I think that's a fair way to put it together, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think this gives other people the opportunity to do the same. I think this will move the needle on sustainability in corporate America and large scale infrastructure projects as they spend the CapEx mm -hmm. to grow, whether that's data centers or other uh, resource intensive uh, earth resource. Exactly. We have trillions of dollars to deploy very quickly, and so how do we aim it and do it okay, well? Okay, final question your vision of the future. Uh, well, basically we find a way to provide for the sort of eight to 10 billion people in the world who want this kind of prosperity in the most efficient way possible. So really focus on sort of sustainable, equitable prosperity. So how do we give people a semblance of this without ruining everything in the process? And if we can help software and data do that a little bit better, fantastic. And you feel that we are on the right path with the trends with supercomputing being democratized and large scale cloud providers processing more it's a huge enabler. We still need the actual sort of uh, like lower carbon waves of producing different commodities and so on, or wind and solar deployments to actually have green electrons and other renewable energy sources as well. So we need, we need the upstream pieces to then have it be to use software and data to deploy it better. Robert, great conversation and congratulations. I love your mission. Obviously, I'm excited and energized by it and, uh, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Fantastic, John. Thanks, Thanks for having me. The Cube. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm John Furrier here at the NYSC studios for the Cube. Your host of theCUBE, thanks for watching.